Welcome, Karen. We are so glad that you're here today to join us at, here at AI and Faith. You recently published a book called The Evangelical Imagination, and it's a, it's a very thought-provoking book. For those who, who are not familiar with your book, could you just maybe give us a, a simple overview of maybe why did you decide to write this book now, and, and what is it all about? Yes, I'd be glad to. Um, first of all, I am an evangelical, and my research um, for the past couple of decades, starting with my um, my PhD, was in the time period in England uh, when evangelicals were rising in influence and um, in all of culture, including literary culture. And so I've carried that knowledge with me all these years, have taught in evangelical institutions, and then in the past several years, I think as, as many people know, evangelicals have become sort of the subject of headlines and controversial and, and uh, politicized. And so uh, in the meantime, my own evangelical students were starting to, um, to share some of the experiences that they had growing up in evangelical subculture. Um, that were negative and harmful. And so I just wanted to sit back and take a long view and say, you know, what what are the things that have formed, um, in particular, the imagination of this movement and these people for 300 years? What's good, what's bad, what's gone wrong, and what can we do to recover some of these good things, if anything? Yeah, and, and it, it's fascinating to see the way that storytelling has shaped a lot of the narrative and the evangelical faith and other other faiths and at AI and faith right now we we have this month dedicated to storytelling and and you referenced a lot of really compelling narratives in your book I I'm just curious to know if you could share like three main takeaways from your book with with our audience today what would they be what what would you be hoping that a reader would come away from reading your book well I do focus on stories um for a number of reasons, partly that's my, you know, my area of teaching and academic expertise. But in the book, even in focusing on stories, I am focusing on the imagination more largely. So that includes all of art and artistic creation, the works of the imagination. And so I think what, you know, the first takeaway would be simply that um, that our imagination, the human imagination, is much bigger and more encompassing. Um, and much more part of our thinking and decision-making every day than we tend to think about it. The imagination is more than what most people tend to think about it. And um, related to that, just simply because the imagination is, is not necessarily always rational or cognitive, um, it's sort of underneath the surface, it actually does drive us and as individuals and influence our lives and our our society more than we think that it might. And then the other thing, which is really what I am talking about more in this book, is that um, imagination is an individual capacity that we all have, but also when we we exist in what the philosopher Charles Taylor calls a social imaginary, which is basically a communal imagination full of concepts, narratives, stories, images, myths, legends, and expectations that we inherit from our cultural and social traditions. Um, and these are often just unexamined assumptions that are driving us and influencing us, and we may not even be aware of it. And so we we need to be aware of them um, for their you know, the way that they're influencing us in, in good ways or bad. I have definitely seen that in, in my life, like the my imagination kind of dictates where my my thoughts go and 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 ultimately my actions and and it could be good or right. or bad and i'm curious to know just as you've you you this is a new book a brand new book this year mm -hmm. was published have you received any any notable feedback or responses from readers that surprised you or resonated with you so far hmm. yeah I, I mean actually i think what's been delightfully surprising is that um that my readers are are getting it um it I, and i don't mean that in an insulting way i just mean that this is a book where i'm really testing out some ideas and and using a method that i haven't seen before a, there are a lot of books coming out now um about evangelicalism in particular that are either sociological or historical or political but none that I know of that are treating this um, movement, this phenomenon, 
by its imagination, its, its works of imagination. And so, um, and of course, one of the main premises, uh, premises of the book is that all language is metaphorical. Um, and so even just the words that we use are metaphors, which are, you know, metaphors are deeply embedded in our language and our stories. And people who are reading it are coming back and telling me that they see metaphors everywhere now, or they see examples of what I've been talking about everywhere. And that's really what I wanted is to, for people to model for people how to think about the imagination and our social imaginary so that they can see far more than I'm able to cover in this book. So that's been wonderful. Wow. Um, that's awesome. And, and we, you probably didn't expect when you were writing this book that you would be invited to talk about it in the context of artificial intelligence. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we are an organization that is trying to promote the values of faith in AI and the development of AI technologies. Um, and so we, we have a, a network, um, the world's largest network of AI experts that are also religious and, and promoting faith. Um, and that's, that's kind of your audience today as, as we're talking about some of the, the ideas in your book. And, and really, just the power of storytelling that it, that it can have. And um, I, I just have a couple questions here and we may, we may diverge based on, on your responses. But in the evangelical imagination, you discuss improvement. That, that one of your chapters is, is titled Improvement. And I remember having this aha moment when you said something that made me realize not all improvement necessarily means it's, it's good for <laughs> us. And sometimes advances in technology can lead to something that's more efficient but has negative consequences. So can you just share your thoughts on any recent advancements in AI technologies and some of the positive or negative consequences that you you see as associated with those improvements? Yeah, no, and I, of course I will um, be completely transparent in saying that I am not well versed in the technology of, of AI. It's something that's as new to me as it is to most people who aren't studying it. Uh, but of course, I'm you know we're all fascinated by it and um, and. So I, I just kind of go old school when I think about anything that is about technology. Um, and I've been greatly influenced by the thinking of Marshall McLuhan, a communications theorist from the 20th century, um, who wrote about technology, specifically in the context of media, which I guess AI is, 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 is a medium. Um, and, you know, his great um, contribution, I think, to any discussion about, con about technology is that it's too easy for us to focus on what it gives and what it, its benefits are um, without considering what it takes away. And so all technology gives us something, but also takes something away. And of course, McLuhan uses, you know, old fashioned examples like the invention of the automobile, which extends our feet, but takes away our closeness to the to the earth and to the roads and um, and so forth. And, but that's a principle that can be applied to all technology. So when it comes to artificial intelligence, I, I would think about what, you know, what can it offer us? And certainly it can offer, um, you know, easy access to a lot of data and, and, and quicker access to, volumes of information that would be hard for us to get, but what it might take away or could take away is some of the creativity and some of the human elements of it. Um, I thought I would share with you my first experience with um, with chat GBT, I guess is what it's called. Right? I had, you know, this was going back last year, and I think it was late in the year when, uh, at least in higher education circles, uh, a lot of articles were coming out about the use of of these technologies by students as you know as a form of plagiarism or cheating but it was before this hit the news in the united states that i had an online student from outside the united states who submitted a paper that was so perfect in every way and it that it it seemed and i it knew nothing about these technologies at that point, but it's I it it seemed inhuman to me, and I ha, but I had no idea why. And I spent a lot of time, as I often do. We have we have plagiarism detection software and so forth. Nothing turned up. I'm used the internet, tried to could not find anything like it, and gave the student um, 
the perfect grade that he seemed to deserve. And then it was just a few weeks later when I learned about this technology and I realized that sort of inhumanity in the paper I had recognized but didn't know how it could have gotten there. And so my concern would be any, you know, any technology can enrich what it means to be human um, and it also can take away from it. And so just reading that paper that was perfect, but yet somehow lacking in spirit and humanity and soul in a way that I recognized but couldn't put my finger on because I didn't have the category. Um, that, that's going to be an experience that kind of stays with me in, anytime I'm thinking about these technologies. But I, I, I know we'll, we'll get a lot further down the road than that, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's funny that you say this, um, you recognize inhumanity in the paper. I can, I can see that in my peers' LinkedIn posts now, if, if, if it's something that doesn't oh. feel like it has, like, I, I know it's like really polished and good, but there's something inhuman. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit more what you, what you mean, or maybe what you recognized mm. in the writing of this student when you say it was inhumanity in the mm. paper? Yeah, I wish I could remember what the topic was. It was a really good topic because I was teaching um, British literature. So <laughs> of course it was an interesting topic. Um, all of the terms, which are, you know, can be very historical and theoretical, all the terms are correct. It seemed like a lot of synonyms were being used and the grammar and syntax were correct. Um, and my first thought was that the student had taken something off the internet and then it replaced um, some of the words with synonyms because that's you know an established way of cheating but even that didn't turn up at anything it didn't make sense so it was just almost the the sheer perfection of it um without any errors whatsoever but also without any life in a way that i can't quantify um i've actually had uh there be, as an author um i've had a couple of other experiences one is that there's an ai generated workbook uh, being sold on a website for my book at the Evangelical Imagination. And when I read the description and of it, as you know, again, as someone who has been teaching students for years, I, I always know how to find plagiarism. I realized that the description of the book would not was not plagiarism in any form, um, that it had ingeniously represented everything in my book while avoiding any words or sentence structure that could be um, described as plagiarism. And I think it would take definitely take a robot to do that because I don't think human beings can do that that well. Yeah, I'm taking notes. This is great. Um, I, yeah, it, it's scary to see um, this inhumanity almost in, in some of the writing. It's so perfect that it loses um, it, it loses something human about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually, you give a warning about this. In, in the evangelical imagination, um, you express a voice of warning for sentimentality um, mm -hmm. and conversion stories or testimonies that are not sincere or genuine or authentic. Um, in the context of ChatGPT or other generative technologies, such as photo or video AI tools, how can creators maintain sincerity in their communication while leveraging the power of these these new technologies. Mm. Um, so I guess that's that's my question. Yeah, yeah. And again, because I because this is a new tech, you know, new new to me and also new to the world, um, I think that, you know, I, I I think there probably are ways that this technology can be used in um, ways that does maintain and increase our humanity. I think right now, as I see it, um, it's it, it's not. And so people are just sort of learning the basics and creating art that looks very, you know, artificial or very weird <laughs> in some cases. Um, and, and if I might make an analogy, it might be a simple analogy, but it's one that's helpful for me. I mean, I remember when Wikipedia first came out and all of the professors were, would, we would tell our students, don't go to Wikipedia, don't go to, you know, it was like the bane of our academic existence. And yet now Wikipedia has become a kind of tool that if we know how to use it well, it can be helpful. It compiles a lot of information and the sources 
sources so you can actually go and follow the sources you can you know go down the trail and it can be a helpful guide but when it first came out students just wanted to go and copy and paste and use it and um but now it's become something that's much more useful and i don't think anybody um would you know, would, would use it the way that it was first being used when it first came out. And so I can see how AI could develop in ways that allow people to um, become more creative by using the tools. But if it's a shortcut to creativity and a shortcut to our humanity, if it becomes an end rather than a, than a means, then I think that's where we'll just continue to see um, sort of these intangible but undeniable um, characteristics that are inhuman. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And just for, for the listeners on this podcast or <laughs> this interview, um, can you maybe define what you mean by sentimental or sentimentality? Yeah, yeah. And how can readers avoid um, sentimental deceptions that are created by artificial stories um, with these technologies? Yeah, when I, in the chapter on sentimentality, uh, I explained that sentimentalism is when we indulge in emotion or excessive emotion for the sake of the emotion. Uh, emotion, of course, is wonderful and beautiful as part of being a human being. I'm not anti-emotion. But when emotion is just sort of carved out and exploited or manipulated just or the experience of the emotion, or uh, you know, or to sell us something because we've gotten emotional or sentimental about it. That's when it becomes dangerous. And so, um, I can see that people who might create things that are, you know, just as they do now uh, on te with television commercials or uh, other uh, forms of, of sales where they try to get to our emotions in order to sell something or in order to exploit us. Um, I mean, human beings can do that in any in any way, but if AI is used to do that, then then obviously we, we fall prey to the same problem. Um, and I think it's something people should think about because it's, it's going to be even easier to exploit our emotions and exploit um, our natural tendency towards sentimentality uh, when there's so many easy ways to create things that can do that. So as, in terms of a creator um, avoiding that, I think I, I think just and part of the whole argument of my book is um, that it's that old truism that knowing the problem or identifying the problem is half of the solution. I think if we know that sentimentality is um, a, a vulnerability for us as human beings um, and and that it is not something that should be exploited. It, we should not be producing art, whether by AI or other means, that is cheap, easy, um, takes a shortcut to you know either interpretation or a conclusion. Um, we shouldn't do that in any art. And so people who are creating with AI should be even extra cautious to avoid these kinds of emotional shortcuts. Yeah. And you mentioned in your book, I think, too, that there are some cases where sentimentalism and emotion are good. Mm -hmm. uh, can maybe, you maybe just share yeah. some of the examples yeah. that you might think of that come to mind when you think of a good way to, mm -hmm. to be sentimental or to have sentimentalism in your yeah. Yeah. I think one of the really complicated examples that I talk about in the book is um, the 19th century American novel Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, that book is credited, you know, whether rightly or wrongly, but I think with some truth, it's credited with starting the Civil War that ended slavery. And that's a good thing. Uh, and it did so by moving people's emotions and helping them to be empathetic and sympathetic to African Americans and to enslaved people. Um, and so that's an example of sentimental art that um, stirred emotions that helped to bring about an end to something that was evil. But the complication is that it did that by kind of trafficking in um, racist stereotypes and tropes that persist today and so if it if we use those kinds of shortcuts and 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 use sentimentality to evoke sympathy and empathy that isn't true to reality 
then they can come, kind of come back and haunt us because when real life people don't live up to the stereotypical tropes um, that we've trafficked in, then then we then we might reject them or or oppress them or you know do all the things that that we have done. And so it can be complicated when we use our emotions um, to accomplish what should be done simply because it's true and just. Yeah. Wow. That's a really awesome insight. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and another thing in, in your book that I found fascinating is you mentioned Charles Dickens a few times and, and specifically a Christmas Carol um, and talked about the conversion story. And there's a whole chapter about conversion um, and, and having authentic conversion stories. But this case in particular, mm -hmm. you, you acknowledge that it, was an, it wasn't a real story, but yet it could have this kind of converting influence on people. Um, could you maybe just let us know a little bit more? Do you think AI technology can help create meaningful conversion narratives to help people experience um, conversion in the real world? Hmm. Well, I think it certainly could if that were um, you know, the intention. If, if AI can create stories and can create stories of that follow any narrative arc, which they do, um, those kinds of stories can be created. Again, I think we will run into some of the same trouble we would run in with um, Uncle Tom's Cabin if the stories are just not um, human enough, not complicated enough, so that they, you know, they cause us to think in either too broad a terms or black and white terms that don't match up with reality. Um, and so we have to be cautious that we can we can see it we can set a pattern and see a pattern um and that can be helpful but we still have to be prepared and trained and schooled um and habituated to real life which is always messy and doesn't have you know conclusions that end in neatly tied bows um some would say that even you know charles dickens works are sentimental in that way and, and including a christmas carol and, and it is in some respect. So it presents sort of a, um, a, a picture writ large of conversion. Um, it's not one that most people would follow exactly by like being dancing in the streets at, you know, in the morning of the, after their conversion, uh, but it can light our hearts and imaginations on fire and set it into a direction that it might not have gone before um, so that we can be more receptive perhaps and in tune to the sort of smaller scale, subtler, more realistic conversions um, that we might encounter around us or hopefully even encounter in our own lives. What role do you see AI technologies playing in religious communities in the future, if, if any? As these technologies come out, I, I imagine many institutions are thinking about how do we use this, either how do we protect ourselves from it or how do we leverage it to, to benefit our congregations and, and their discipleship? Um, mm. Do you have any thoughts or ideas of how this technology could be used mm. for the betterment? Yeah, no, I, and again, I'm skeptical of, of any shortcuts that are, you know, that strip us of any of our humanity. And so, you know, that's the caveat I'll throw out there. But I did read an article in Christianity Today recently about, um, just as an example, like the the aggregation of of theology or biblical texts um, in databases that AI could could you know create that would be useful for people. And I think um, that's a possibility. And and I remember that that one of the takeaways in that article, which I think is a principle that the church needs always, even apart from this topic, is transparency. Like citing the sources, citing even sort of the bias or the slant. Um, you know, there, there, I remember one of the earlier um, stories of AI that I read in, in the higher education realm was this was that a university was using AI counselors when students would call for help or therapy, and they were they didn't know that they were getting answers from some sort of a um, technology. And so the ethical issue there was at that point is not whether or not, you know, sort of processing your feelings with a with a bot may or may not be helpful because maybe it is helpful, but it was the lack of transparency. And so this is an age in which the church and its institutions 
are crumbling, I would say, because of um, sort of a uniform uh, or pervasive lack of transparency in a, in a number of areas not even related to AI. So I would say that the same principle needs to apply, that there needs to be transparency when we're using a tool, um, there needs to be transparency about it, what the tool is supposed to do and not what it's um, not supposed to do. Those are things we have to think about. Um, yeah, that, that's really important to, I mean, you gave the example of sharing your emotions with a chat bot or an AI tool and they could guide you through. If you're transparent about what that experience really is and not trying to deceive someone, then right. um, then maybe it could be useful, but, um, but the lack of transparency could cause harm. Okay. I, I'm curious to know, just given that the people watching this interview are probably well-versed in, in AI technologies and <laughs> Is and I am clearly not. <laughs> and, well, that's and that's okay. That's totally fine. This is all about storytelling mostly. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would want to help, that you would want to share with them just as they continue to develop and promote AI technologies mm -hmm. in their respective fields? Right. Anything that you, you wish that they would just keep in mind or remember? I'll, I'll leave this one kind of open for you to... Yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, of course, because I am an English professor and because I teach... 18th and 19th century British literature. I cannot let this opportunity go by without encouraging everyone to read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, which is really the, you know, it, well, it is considered the first work of science fiction. Um, and for anyone who hasn't read it and has maybe just seen sort of the bad film adaptations of it, the novel is entirely different from any um, film version of it. It's a deeply philosophical and theological and sociological and anthropological reflection on what it means to be human, what it means to sort of play the part of God in developing a technology that can you know, get, escape our control and harm humanity. Um, and it you know, raises the really, really important question of just, you know, because we can do something, should we do it? Now, of course, with AI, you know, the genie is out of the bottle and, and there's no going back, but we can still and must still ask the questions, ask the prevailing question, what is it for? Like, what are we using this for? Um, and it's so important not to confuse, as I said before, um, end for means and means for end. And so, especially as people of faith, I know that um, that question will res resonate. Um, telos, purpose, what are we here for um, as human beings? And in answering that question, then we can better answer the questions about any technologies that we might use. Like how can these technologies help us as human beings to fulfill our purpose for being on this earth? Yeah, I like that. What are we using it for? Are we keeping it a means or is it becoming an end in itself? Yes. Um, that's really awesome. And I, I want to give you the opportunity. You don't have to, but in your book, you talk a lot about testimony. Um, mm -hmm. Would you would you like to share your testimony with the listeners here today or anything? Oh, sure, sure. No, um, yeah, <laughs> um, I do have a whole chapter on that and uh, have lots of things to say about that in, in, in the book and even in my own life. And uh, part, you know, I think maybe for this audience, the part of my testimony that might um, be most helpful um, is just to share that, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, became a Christian at a very young age, um, but never understood uh, or was taught or had any examples for integrating my faith into my academic life, into my passion and love. I mean, even before I had an academic life as a literature professor, I just loved reading books. And even as a child who loved to read books and felt like I was learning more about God and the world and people through books than through Sunday school and church, I still, I, I didn't know how to bridge those two. And so I kept them kind of separated um, through most of my life until I was near the end of my PhD program when I finally realized um, through, you know, a series of events, but it was rather quick that, that the God I loved who is the word and who created words, it is also the source of my love of words. And so I was able to finally put my love of 
God, my faith, together with my love of the life of the intellect and the mind and books. And um, I just, I think that I've encountered a lot of Christians out there in different professions who, who have done that, or maybe those who are struggling to do that. And for me, that is the biggest part of my testimony is seeing how God made me and gave me certain desires and passions um, and ways of using my mind and that those can be and hopefully have been used to glorify him um, and uh, to help me to love him better. And so um, I would wish that for anyone who's working in this must be very difficult field at a very difficult time. Uh, and so I hope that's just a bit of an encouragement to anyone who's listening. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Karen. And you mentioned earlier, when we think, what are we using this for, finding God's plan for us? It sounds like you've found God's plan for you, at least to a degree um, mm -hmm. in your life. And that's that's really awesome to hear. Yeah, like I, I did, and then I think, and then I think the plan changed. So I'm in a, you know, and, and we have to be ready for that as well. And um, and uh, so yeah, so I'm entering a stage of life where I'm, I think I'm just going to be turning to full time writing and uh, be out of the classroom formally. Um, and uh, I think that's what what God's called me to do. So. Well, that's really exciting. We wish you all the best in that journey. Thank you. And Thank you. You touch lives all around the world. One other question for you. Do you have any advice for how to become a better storyteller? Given your experience, both as a consumer and producer of literature, what counsel would you share with someone striving to become a better storyteller? Well, I think the advice is similar to the advice for becoming better at anything, and that is to uh, immerse yourself in the great. Um, so read good literature, read good stories, um, pay attention to what makes them good. And this includes not just literature, but even great film, um, all forms of great stories. Uh, but again, part of the key is paying attention and asking yourself what makes this good. Like there are also lots of good books out there or workshops about storytelling if someone wants to be very serious about it. Um, one of my favorite works that I teach over and over is Mystery and Manners by Flannery O'Connor. She was a Catholic um, short story writer and novelist. Um, and she, in, in this collection of essays, she actually explains her art. She explains how she, and why she tells stories the way she does uh, and because she's like sacramental and incarnational. And I think for people of faith, they can learn a lot about being intentional about telling stories that reveal not just the manners of people, but the mystery of creation and God. That's awesome. And do you have any, any other greats that come to mind when you think about people that you would go to to learn from? Yeah, so um, another person who writes about stories and, and storytelling and writing is George Saunders. He's a short story writer and novelist, and he has a, um, a wonderful book called a, uh, Swim in the Rain in the Pond, I think it's called. Um, and so he also writes his own short stories. And then in terms of just great literature, I mean, there's so much out there. I mean, I'm a lover of the novel form, uh, especially um, British novels, but I actually recommend um, the list of, uh, let's see, it's the modern library list of 100 greatest novels. Uh, you can just go on there and kind of pick the ones that are by an author or set in a time that interests you. And short stories too are just a great, more compact way of looking at the power of stories. So you can buy a volume like, you know, the 100 Best American Short Stories or um, a collection by any short story writer. There's so many ways to go about it, but um, so much that you can learn by uh, immersing yourself in the craft and uh, observing the greats. I like that, that intentional kind of observation. And um, if I, yeah, can I add one other thing yeah. about it? Yeah, because, um, you know, one of the just a difference between good literature and bad is that good literature really wrestles with the human condition. It's complicated, like real life is, um, but literature that is overly didactic or advocates or tries to make a point of view or a conclusion clear and neat and tied up in a bow um, is inferior because it doesn't really reflect the way life really is. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. So good literature, good stories are representative of what, what real life is like. Is that exactly, what exactly. And that, you know, of course, real life has tragedy and it has comedy. And so it covers a whole range of, of stories and outcomes, but it still, it causes, it doesn't tell us, it shows us. Cool. Yeah. Don't just tell, show, show what you're trying to communicate. Love yes. that. Yeah. That's really cool. And that actually kind of ties into this next question that we have today. And that's neuroscience seems to be showing more and more that we are hardwired to learn through stories. Mm -hmm. um, how have you experienced that in your, in your years in the classroom? How do you incorporate storytelling into your own teaching and communication? Mm. Well, I feel like I cheated my whole life because I teach stories, right? <laughs> so, so I also am immersed in reading the stories and teaching the stories. And so I think um, in trying to teach my students about stories, um, it's helpful. I find it most helpful to, um, to tell the larger story around those stories. So that might include things like um, aspects of, of the author's life or uh, what's going on in the historical period at that time so that we can better understand, again, not just the story itself, but the story around the story. Uh, so whether we're reading fiction, um, as I often teach, uh, or we're studying some other subject matter, all of those things are still in a larger story, just as our lives are part of a larger story. And so I think if we see whatever it is we're teaching or studying or grappling with as a story within a story within a story, um, then I think we we are much uh, better on a much better path toward understanding the larger human experience. That's awesome. A story within a story within a story. <laughs> um, <that laughs> yeah, you could add many layers around that. Reception. Yeah, that's what real life is like. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, that that is all of our questions today, Karen. We're super grateful that you took the time to meet with us. Thank you for having me. I hope it's beneficial to your listeners. I think it will be. I think it will be for sure.